Hi, everyone. Welcome to Interchange. I'm Dan Jones. Thank you so very much for joining us. Well, we have lots to talk about today. Some big losses for Milwaukee Democrats in the state legislature this week. State lawmakers say yes to downsizing the Milwaukee County Board, yes to doing away with residency requirements for public employees, yes to more limits on what people can buy with food stamps, and no to a Milwaukee streetcar line. We'll talk about it all. And we'll talk about that incredibly sad and bizarre story out of Cleveland, the guy who kept three young women hostage for a decade. All right, let me introduce everybody. We have longtime newspaper columnist Joel McNally, Kevin Fisher, former broadcast journalist, political analyst, oftentimes a fill-in host over on WISN Talk Radio. You know, Denise Calloway, community affairs and public relations professional. And Mr. Gerard Randall, education consultant and local job creation expert. Rick Horwitz will be along with commentary at the end of the show. All right, first let's talk about what happened in the state capitol this week. Actions which still have to be approved by the full legislature, but that approval is expected. First, let's talk about the requirement that public workers can be required to live in the communities where they work. It looks like that is going down, though police and firefighters will still have to live within 15 miles of where they work. This change is a rule that's been on the boards in Milwaukee for 75 years, Kevin. Good thing, bad thing? Let freedom ring. Uh, th this is wonderful news uh, for freedom believers and freedom fighters that think that it, this is America. You should be able to live where you want to live. Now, I talked with some police officers this week. They would prefer that there not be any, re any requirements whatsoever. But they can understand the compromise. They can agree with it. It's something they can live with. And I think 15 miles from the city limits is, is reasonable. Uh, I don't think you're going to see a lot of them moving out to, say, Oconomowoc with the price of gas in our economy today. That's not, not going to happen. So I, I think this is good. Not maybe good for the mayor who had a very bad week this week, but it's good for all those city employees who I, I think do have the right to say, look, I should be able to live where I want to live. And I don't think city services will be hurt. I don't think Milwaukee will become the next Detroit. I think that's a ludicrous uh, argument to make. And, and uh, I think it's just a, a matter of time before this is signed into law. Denise, you think this will cause flight out of Milwaukee, not just white flight, but white, black, Hispanic city workers who want out? I think there certainly is the potential for some of that. But to me, the bigger issue is not whether or not people move. It's the fact that you have state government, and particularly a party that says it's, it's for small government, really um, imposing on a city another body of government, what it thinks is best for it. I mean, to me, that's the problem, as we've talked about all these issues. It is, there is no such thing as local control for the city of Milwaukee on these key issues that, we, that we're going to be talking about that do help to influence and drive the city's destiny. And I do think there, there is a chance that this is going to significantly harm property values here in the city of Milwaukee. You know, there was already a story this week about the fact that the city has become um, an unintentional landlord because of the number of, of tax foreclosures that the city owns now. It, you know, it, it is looking like it's going to be more than 2,000 by the end of this year. You know, so the city already is in a very depressed housing situation. And then you go ahead and add this situation where certainly housing prices are going to be deflated. Everybody who I've talked to who's in real estate says that's what they expect is going to happen. And it's going to hit certain parts of the city particularly hard. But this is an issue where for every person who is a city employee, every single person understood when they applied for the jobs, when they accepted the jobs, that, they, that residency in the city of Milwaukee was a requirement. This is not a big surprise. And particularly, I think, when we take a look at police and firefighters, there is no shortage of qualified applicants. None. You're, you're, it, it's, it's an issue where it, 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 it has created, a, it has done the a great job of creating a problem where there was not an issue. Everybody who's, who works for the city, everybody who works for the school system knows that that is a condition of, of employment. And when you talk about freedom, you have the freedom that if you find that this is not something that you want to do, that you don't want to live in the city, then don't apply for the job. You're a city taxpayer, too. Is this, it, next year at this time, is your assessment going to be lower than it is right now? Uh, well, I hope not. I mean, we all hope not. Because but, of this? But, but he, well, here's, here's where I am on this. Because I've told you before, I, I actually don't like residency requirements. 
uh, you know, I organized a union, was part of a union bargaining, and, and you know, we wouldn't require, you know, people who work for a newspaper to live in the city where, uh, you know, their newspaper is located. Uh, I don't like residency rules, but I tell you what I do like, I actually do like collective bargaining. Uh, where management and workers uh, negotiate, give and take. They have, both sides have rights and, and they can come to an agreement. What has happened bizarrely in this state is the governor and the legislator, legislature killed collective bargaining for public employees, except <laughs> for police and firemen. And then in addition to letting police and firemen continue to negotiate when no other public employees could, uh, they say, well, and besides that, we're going to pass laws to do the, the negotiating for the police and firemen. Uh, you know, they haven't been able to win this residency requirement through legitimate negotiations for 75 years. But, but we'll just pass a law because, after all, the, the police unions and, and the fire union uh, endorse Republicans and endorse Scott Walker for governor. So we'll just jump in the middle of their labor negotiations, the only labor negotiations we permit, and we will come down on the side of uh, the people who have endorsed us, who have contributed money to our campaigns. That's corrupt, it is foul, and, and if there's anybody who should be required to live in the city uh, among public employees, it would be police and fire. We have had, both of those organizations in our city have faced major racial lawsuits for failing to hire African Americans, and now we're gonna let people who work for those two organizations live in the suburbs and come in and police uh, the city even though they are suburbanites, um, and that's like an occupation force. Is that what's gonna happen? You know, my fear is that <clears throat> in the two uh, corners of the city, you've got so many municipal workers that are poised to cross the border. And uh, I, I am concerned about property values. I am concerned about the mindset of folk who live there that don't uh, have the same appreciation for the city today that maybe they had 30 years ago. Uh, I'm worried that uh, even if 10% leave, appraised values go down, assessed values go up so that they can collect more taxes to support the, uh, the, the services that are left. So yeah, those things do concern me. All right. Lawmakers also approved a measure which would limit the amount of food stamp money poor folks can spend on junk foods. Is that a good thing which will help keep those people healthy? Or is that government getting a way a little too involved in things, though it is taxpayer money we're talking about? Uh, and, you know, ordinary uh, folks uh, that live in the inner city don't pay taxes. Uh, they're taxpayers too, you know. Uh, the idea, and, and it really, I, I said a long time ago, Poor people would eat better if they had more practice. Uh, this idea that the legislature should dictate to poor people, because they're poor, what they're allowed to spend their food stamps on uh, is just really offensive to me. Uh, they also passed a law this week that said uh, we aren't going to let any local communities pass any of these Bloomberg bills about, you know, you can't buy great big things of soda. Uh, you know, so any, anything that affects what they want to buy or their freedom to buy whatever they want, uh, they would never stand for. But they can, they can tell poor people, because you're poor, uh, do you know that all the supermarkets have abandoned the inner city of Milwaukee? Do you know that the only place that many of them have to buy food are these junk stores on corners that are selling drugs under the, under the counter and every kind of junk food, you know, above the counter? Uh, you know, yes, I believe in poor people eating healthy and Will Allen and Growing Power and organizations like that are doing everything they can to educate and to get good healthy food to those people. Uh, but this idea that, boy, you poor people, we can tell you what you're even allowed to eat, uh, that is just totally offensive to me. It is like the, the great white father, you know, looking down on the poor and telling them, there used to be a time in this country when food stamps were bipartisan. Both parties supported, let's feed children. You know, let's, you know, there shouldn't be hunger in America, the richest country on earth. Now the Republican Party is attacking poor people for buying food and wants to tell them what they can eat. But Kevin, is, is, it, is it horrible for the government to say, we want you to eat healthy, we want you to eat fruits, vegetables, milk, and not 
Fritos, Tito's, and subsidized Hostess program. And, and you were just talking about freedom a minute ago. Well, uh, if if you're That's going everybody. if you're going to have yeah. uh, food stamps, well, I, I think this is a marvelous thing. Don't you want poor people to eat healthy? Don't you want them to be Let's well? Laws don't you want them to live longer? I, I think those are wonderful things. And when you have the First Lady consistently, constantly pontificating and lecturing to taxpayers what they should eat. And being what attacked the, by what, Republicans. What they can and cannot eat. Well, I think it's only fair then to say that if you are <laughs> going to subsidize the diets of people on food stamps, and it's not just black people in the inner city, Joel. There are a lot of white people on food stamps right. as well. M- I think, majority. I think it's fair. I think they watered down the thing. I, it started out, you know, 100% of the food you eat must be healthy. They say now two-thirds must be healthy, and the other third can be whatever you want. Okay, I don't know how you enforce that, but I think if you're asking taxpayers to foot the bill for what poor people eat, I don't think it's going too far to say, hey, you know, it can't be just candy bars and soda and Doritos. It has to be some healthy foods, too. You know, this, this grows from one of these urban myths about, yes, it does. It does. It does. It does. It's the same as people saying, talking about the welfare queens riding in Cadillacs. These things don't exist. You don't find people spending all of their food stamp money on soda and candy. It doesn't happen. Joel brought up the real issue that exists, and if the legislature wants to step in to do something, let's see how it can step in to provide some support. We have in our community, and also in parts of our state, food deserts. People cannot access the food they are now being ordered to eat. It does not exist. You have great opportunities at places like Finding Market, but Finding Market's not open 12 minutes out of the year. We don't do that here in Wisconsin. So you're telling people you can only eat this food, but oh, by the way, good luck trying to find it and access it in your community. It doesn't make sense. It seems to be a way to, again, somehow punish people who are on food stamps. When have you talked to anybody who's ever been on food stamps, that's not where they want to be. It's an effort, again, to pu- to punish them, to in some ways demonize the poor, where, you know, we don't want our money going to help poor people eat pretzels or, you know, I don't know, pretzels might be considered healthy under this. The reality of it is when we have seen, particularly in this last recession, where some of the greatest growths in poverty came and where some of the greatest growth in, um, in food stamp usage came, percentage-wise, it didn't come in the city of Milwaukee. It came in some of the surrounding communities. Was it was it a, a well-intentioned proposal or a mean-spirited proposal? I don't think it was mean-spirited. I, I look at it as <clears throat> putting regulations on in the same way that there's regulations on what can be uh, spent by those who access the women, infants, and children's program. Uh, the problem is, though, that there was benign support that was given by the Grocers Association which could have done more to address the problem that Joel and and Denise have raised, and that is how do you gain access in some of these communities to that healthy food that that the legislature wants to promote access to, uh, when if you go in most of these uh, corner stores, uh, neighborhood stores, the the preponderance of what they sell isn't uh, fresh food. It's, It's packaged. Oftentimes, it's out-of-date food. Um, It's rare that inspectors will come in and and police those areas for freshness uh, in the way that they might go into a neighborhood roundies. Uh, So I've got real concerns that that side of the equation wasn't addressed. All right, we move on. Lawmakers also passed a measure which will prohibit the city of Milwaukee from making utility ratepayers pick up the cost of moving things if they build a downtown streetcar line. It's likely that gas, electric, phones, sewer lines would all have to be relocated. That would cost millions. It's pretty likely, isn't it, that, that this will kill this streetcar project, even though Barrett says we're going to push ahead with it. Well, it might. Uh, this, it's just like you know many of the other topics that we talked about. The legislature jumping into Milwaukee to tell it what it can and cannot do. Uh, you know, these legislators from out in Nina or Manasha or whatever, uh, telling Milwaukee how to spend their money, 
they wouldn't uh, stand for that in Nina or Menasha or anywhere else around the state. They don't want the state legislature jumping into local government and making these decisions. I think there, there's, you know, I, I, I think there would be better ways to spend the $50 million we have from the federal government for transportation than the streetcar. I've said that before. The best mm -hmm. use would be to get people in the city of Milwaukee who need jobs out in Waukesha, some kind of transportation to get out to Waukesha, but Waukesha won't stand for it because they don't want people from Milwaukee who need jobs to be out there. Well, and, I'm with you on the first part of that equation. But that's exactly yeah, what that, happened. That, that, that it was a bad that way exactly to what spend the money uh, that was available, that $50 million. And, and let's put it in some context. This is a 20-plus year battle. Um, as to how to spend this remaining hundred million dollars uh, that was given to this community uh, through the federal government. So now it's the 50 million and the mayor's best plan is this streetcar, uh, which has a price tag attached to it that's far greater than the 50 million. In fact, that's probably just going to cover the construction but not the ongoing operating costs. And so there should be full disclosure about that. But it's that using it for some useful purpose, so which I, it's not being used for I, now. I, I would well, say that if they we had gone back... The show months ago. Right. So, so don't be praising if, it now. If George. they had gone back and had talked about putting it into public transportation that would give people better access to jobs, that would have been true mm -hmm. regional collaboration and true support for... Except uh, the region uh, won't support it. Waukesha won't support it. Well, but the mayor still could have said... In partnership with the county, we're going to use this money to put buses out into those communities. They could have done that too. And that may be what ultimately ends is, up is this happening. Another, is, is this another example of the legislature, because the Republicans control it now, no. telling they Milwaukee this is what want. we're oh, going yeah, to do? No, oh, sure no, it is. no. Sure it is. And this argument that the legislature is telling the city of Milwaukee what it can and cannot do uh, doesn't tell the whole story. In this particular case, uh, the mayor wants We Energies to pick up the tab for ripping up the streets and ripping up the utility lines in order to install this this folly trolley that will go in a circle and will, will not That's provide cool. any economic benefit to the city of Milwaukee. Suburbs. Well, what's We Energies going to do? Simple economics. They're going to pass that cost along to their ratepayers, most of which do not live in the city of Milwaukee. They live in surrounding areas. They can't they, do it. They live, in, North, they live in northern Wisconsin. And why should we expect people who live in the upper peninsula of Michigan to pay for this trolley? And the mayor, he put all <laughs> his chips on the table, all his eggs in one basket, and said, it's my way or the highway. He didn't want to compromise, and he, and he walked away from the table <laughs> this week with nothing. That, that's, the, the whole issue, and Gerard said it correctly, is that this is something we've been going back and forth on for the past 10 years on how to spend this money. The mayor, has, the mayor has worked very hard to try to say, is there a way that we can initially, to say, is there a way we can spend this money to do something about expanding bus service into communities where people need to be able to get to for jobs? Didn't happen. So he's trying to find a way to spend the money. Now, you may not like it, but if people in this community feel that it's inappropriate. There's a way for people who live, work, and vote in this community to express that. And that is through the ballot box. That is at election time. It's no more appropriate for the legislature to say, Mayor, you cannot spend this money on X, than it would be for them to tell that to the mayor of Green Bay, to say, you know what? You can't spend this money that you have that you want to be able to spend on Let renovating land. But Let me finish. Let him Let me finish. Let me finish. On, um, so I see, you know, we're already back to normal. <laughs> um, to go ahead and say that I want to pay to improve Lambeau Field. No, I'm sorry, you can't do that. This is not the legislature's business. It is a matter, again, of local control. And, you know, quite frankly, I wish the legislature would have spent as much time on job creation and job development beyond the one trick pony on the mines as it has in terms of taking a look at what Milwaukee County doesn't need to do. I'd much rather have the legislature spend time saying, this is what we need to do to create jobs. And that hadn't happened. All right, can we talk for a few minutes about the guy in Cleveland who is now in custody for keeping three women hostage for a decade? What an incredibly sad and bizarre story. It does make you wonder how in a crowded city neighborhood no one would suspect this guy over such a long period of time? I, I think this goes to how our neighborhoods and the people who live in neighborhoods have become more and more anonymous and less neighborly. Um, that someone 
that three people, let alone a person, could be held hostage uh, for that length of time and all the signs for anyone who had interaction with this person that raised flags, never got addressed over this time frame. Uh, and, and even the, the family of the former wife who labeled him a monster, uh, clearly that. He knew himself that he was dealing with his own demons internally, never got addressed. Um, and then all of a sudden the light bulb goes on with all of the folks who saw the signs after the fact. Uh, to me, just points to how disengaged we've become with people who live next to us, who live in our communities, and, uh, and, and we actually have no genuine real contact with them. Could you see this happening anywhere? Potentially, yes. I think, you know, Gerard's right. For, in many communities, people don't know their neighbors. They don't know who their neighbors are. They see people coming and going, and that's just about it. But I, I think the thing that is just so horrific about this is that even when there are warning signs, I, it's really hard, I think, for people to jump to say, well, I'm worried about what I see here. Could that mean this man is holding people hostage in this house? I mean, it's such a far-flung leap for us to make that I think it's very difficult for people to wrap their arms around something that horrific having occurred. I mean, the only good thing that has come out of this is that those families that thought they would never, ever see their daughters again ha have been able to be reunited with them. It's and you know, a miracle that it they're is. alive. Because it normally is. in cases like this, as we all know, that the, the ending is totally different. Mm -hmm. And there's been criticism now of law enforcement and some of the neighbors. Well. How could you not know something was going on because the shades were always down or the windows were broken or, or, or something like that? There, there was a, even a false report of a naked woman on a, on a leash in the yard. That, that, never, that never materialized. No call was ever made to the police about that. But if we, we, we can't make that leap, as you talked about, Denise, mm -hmm. oh, the shades are always down. The, 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 the windows are never up. You never see anybody. The, the, there's, the, the house looks horrible. If, if we, 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 are, we don't automatically and thankfully make that leap that, oh, my goodness gracious, someone's a, a sex predator is holding right. people. Uh, sex hostage. predator Howard Hughes. Yeah, Take yeah care. exactly. Yeah. Well, only 30 seconds. But could you see something like this ever happening in, a, in an Elm Grove, a Whitefish Bay, a Shorewood? Or is, it, is this a, an urban thing? I don't see something like this happening ever. Now, that doesn't mean this didn't happen, and it did. Uh, it's a horror story. It's a very rare story. I agree absolutely with what uh, Gerard and Denise said about we don't really know our neighbors in cities anymore. But the truth of the matter is these are very rare events. But I will tell you, every time they happen, uh, they're on television, and you hear, and, you know, you get to hear all those stories and false rumors and junk. And we spend a lot of time talking about something that is not a reality for, and and giving the impression that women and children are being snatched off the street all the time is not happening. Well, it was a well-publicized and highly anticipated thing, a congressional examination of an American tragedy. It was exactly the sort of thing that often finds Rick Horowitz glued to his TV. Rick? I really was planning to watch those Benghazi hearings, but then I realized I already had the Salem witch trials on Blu-ray. <laughs> Same plot and much better special effects. I've got to tell you, the concern those House Republicans showed for the Americans who died in the Benghazi attacks was truly touching, especially since some of them were the very same Republicans who had voted to cut spending on diplomatic security around the world. Guilty consciences? No way. They had bigger fish to fry. Or do I mean witches to burn? A witch called Obama and another one called Hillary. You know, just planning ahead. Don't misunderstand me. It's always good to know how our government is doing its job, and if it messed up, to figure out what went wrong and how to fix it. If it takes hearings to do that, to bring in witnesses, get all the facts, assign responsibility, then absolutely, let's have hearings. I just thought it might make more sense to schedule these uh, pin the blame on the donkey sessions in descending order of body count. The Iraq war, for instance, and the cherry-picked, overhyped, absolutely wrong information about weapons of mass destruction. We lost more than 4,000 Americans there, going to war under false pretenses and then failing to plan for the aftermath. You'd think you'd do hearings on that one first, find out who screwed up so badly. And after that one, you might want to look at all the missed signals before 
all the dots that weren't connected, all the warnings that were ignored. Almost 3,000 dead that time. I don't remember Republicans demanding hearings on those screw-ups or wall-to-wall -wall scandal coverage on Fox News. Let's just say that their lack of curiosity then compared to now is curious. Let's just call this current burst of investigative zeal a bit disproportionate. Here, decide for yourself. Here's a coin for each of the four brave men, Chris Stevens and the others, who lost their lives that night in Benghazi. And now here's a coin for each of the innocent souls who were killed on 9-11. That's the sound of hypocrisy. Thank you, Rick, and thank you so very much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.